you everyone for coming to this uh, makeup session of this class. This will be the first of uh, approximately five that uh, we undertake. Um, I might throw in uh, a sixth um, to, to better cover certain material uh, before the next month is out. Um, and I appreciate the flexibility in your schedule to accommodate these. Um, So within today's lecture, I'd like to expand on some of the material uh, whose coverage we initiated last time. Uh, we began last lecture talking about the fact that um, we can assess the dimensionality of state space given uh, a set of variables um, uh, that jointly collectively summarize the state of a given model. So if we have x and we have y, say for a model of predator-prey, um, we could characterize the state space plot um, much like this one. And I noted that as a kind of motivating factor that in nonlinear models, we often have a model subject to such coupling that the actual state space occupied by the model is a small fraction, a small manifold, a thin manifold within this uh, broader overall state space. That the model is not exercising all of its degrees of freedom here. You know, any value of x can't go with any old value of y in a willy-nilly fashion. Um, uh, rather, the, because of coupling, and because of coupling that's irredeemably squeezed into the model due to the nonlinearities involved, can't be separated out neatly in, a, in some linear transformation into separate eigenmodes. Um, we, we have this close dependence. If you tell me about x, I can tell you a lot about the possible values of y. Right? So if I tell you about x here, it tells me quite a lot of y. And I built some intuition for that. But the fact remained that uh, within those models, uh, within this, this demonstration, we were operating with, uh, with models where we, uh, where we were looking in an in a omniscient way, as it were, um, at all state variables. So for example, here we see a model uh, articulated in any logic with uh, lynxes and hares, right? Um, and we could run that model, for example. Um, and we'll have uh, lynxes and hares, uh, you know, moving within the, uh, the system here. Right now we have only uh, lynxes, but, uh, excuse me, only hares, but with a little bit of additions, we'll get our, our lynxes. And we could plot out a graph of lynxes versus hares that is induced by this model, that's implied by that model. And it would evolve over time. And uh, here we see, because of the stochastics, it's uh, not evolving in a neat way. But one thing to not lose track of is it's still occupying only a, a, a sort of a compact area of this space. It's not occupying all of the space. It's, it's actually quite bounded between about 400 and 945 and 105, okay? Um, with marked stochastics. The model Wager sent was embellished by his hand, no less, um, uh, to, uh, to include a larger space, a space where the, uh, the statistical fluctuations wouldn't be quite as, as marked. And once again, um, we can see uh, proliferation here. And we see evolution of the system in a state space in a way that's fairly compact here. Okay. Um, what's that? It looks like a road. And by any other name, it is just a um, <laughs> I think that was a, is that a sonnet? Um, yes. Um, uh, so, so um, a rose it is um, uh, that that captures uh, some regularities of the system. And if you look carefully, 
What you'll actually see is some mode switching behavior between it sometimes, whereby it, it may switch from one dominant mode to another. Um, uh, and uh, it, its its evolution remains bounded. It is jagged. Look, look at that mode switching. See it? Did you see that? The intellectual fragrance of that is quite overwhelming. Um, and uh, and and yet, for a period of time, for stasis, it evolves within a fairly compact area, and then it will switch to a different mode. Um, the point is, though, once again, we're not exercising the full degrees of freedom of the state space. One of them is so coupled to the other, even with these stochastics, that knowing about one will actually tell you quite a bit about the other. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, whilst we contemplated uh, this sort of state space plot, we were left with a feeling um, of a lack of full satiation, a lack of full full satisfaction uh, because of the fact that these sort of demonstrations or these sort of examinations require a full knowledge of model state space. We're plotting here links versus hairs. And often for real world systems, we lack, to say the least, an omniscient understanding of the, uh, the full system's behavior. We lack a full access to the state variables. Perhaps we don't even know what are the relevant, most natural state variables in which to specify the evolution of the system. Um, so that brought us to the second major topic, which I introduced last time, which had to do with a profound result coming out of the work of Floris Takens, mathematician Floris Takens in the 1980s which was revolutionary in its understanding. And that observed the fact that um, whilst we can plot out a state space using full knowledge of, of system state variables, we can reconstruct something that is just like that state space, that is diffeomorphic to the state space. It's just a stretched, squeezed version of it. Um, using just a single variable within that, within that state space. And by the right transformation of the time series associated with that variable, this kind of mechanical transformation, we could turn that into a representation of the state space of the system that's driving it. Note my comments there, because there will be comments that before the hour is out, to which I will come back, to which I will return. So here I show two state space plots. Uh, well, they are state space plots, but they're embedding plots. Links on the x-axis versus links some time unit ago uh, on the, the, the y-axis. Hairs on the x-axis versus hairs one time unit ago on the y-axis. Okay. And you'll notice that they look similar. But more to the point, they, they have a certain similarity to the rows that lies before us. Um, admittedly, the roseate character of this has been squished um, uh, and, uh, and compressed. But the compact nature of this, of this distribution of points here is reflected in the compact nature to the right as well. Okay, um, And uh, uh, I'm, I'm exhibiting a, a point of uh, forgetfulness here. Bottom Remind right. me, uh, upper right here? Bottom right. B bottom, ah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Wade. Um, so these two are, in fact, mirrors of each other. And I'd like to show you a demonstration which brings this out with greater clarity. Um, here I ask you to, to, to um, open your mind to this possibility. But the next model should make it much clearer yet. Um, because you'll see the orbits better defined in a model that exhibits less, uh, uh, less stochastics. Less pr 
less part or marked stochastic. In fact, this model, I think, is devoid of stochastics. So this is a classic, and it's a variant of a classic predator-prey model. Okay, um, lynxes and hares, um, as very similar to what we have written upon the board, but in a weird idiosyncratic any logic twist on that. Um, here are lynxes versus hares. I've uh, just like I've drawn it there. I I eliminated the stochastics, but um, I did so uh, with with uh, uh, judiciousness because if I included stochastics from here, we'd actually get some results that are not representative of many systems. We'll come back to that. But what I want to draw your attention to is this is hairs versus legs, the omniscient view. Here's the non-omniscient view. This is hairs versus hairs at time t minus 1. Links, ladies and gentlemen, versus links at time t minus 1. And you'll notice a resemblance. It's a resemblance undiminished by, by geometric distortion, by geometric squeezing. Um, and, and it's unmistakable. This reflects, this shape is none other than a squished version of this, and likewise here. So either of these contains within it hairs, contain within it an understanding of the broader system that's driving them, which includes hairs, but it also includes links. Links, this depiction from the links time series, plotting simply links at a given time versus links at the previous time point, um, or some amount of time before, one ton unit before, whatever that is. Um, also, that encodes the value of the, the, um, the hairs. And so it is that it reproduces um, the, the hairs here. Um, uh, so, so we have this reproduction of hairs versus links using data from only one of these, uh, one of these time series alone. Um, just uh, in my capacity as, as someone who needs to interact with the tech staff about this room, uh, Bryce, is that your laptop there? It is not. Okay. Do you know who's... Oh. <laughs> I have learned. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to be sure it was not orphaned uh, nor forgotten. Um, now, what I've said, I've marred by jest and... Um, I, I, I want to restate that. When we have an evolving system, a coupled nonlinear system, within broad, you know, broad constraints, the, f the state space of that system is encoded in the information about the evolution of the state space, its evolution over time, is encoded in the value of a, of a given variable over time, just a single variable over time, encodes the information about the evolution of the entire system which is directly or indirectly driving it. It's demonstrated mathematically uh, with clarity for a broad class of systems. And we see it illustrated here. That has profound implications because whilst it is comparatively rare that we have a, a God's eye view, as it were, an omniscient view of a system where we know every state variable at a given time, it is incomparably more common that we have recourse to time series of information about one particular aspect of that system. For example, about hairs in northern Manitoba, or lynx in, uh, in middle north Saskatchewan. And yet, that one time series can allow us to reconstruct an understanding of the broader system driving of, of its evolution at state space. Now there's a lot of subtleties here, but the significance of this point can barely be overstated in terms of our ability to gather information about a system across its varied extent 
using data just about that that's seems to be localized within the system, that's drawn from just one piece of the system. It, it offers to us the tantalizing possibility that, um, that through, through limited data collection and feasible data collection uh, on one area of the system, we could secure insights and confident understanding about what's going on throughout that system which drives it. It also points to the fact almost entirely ignored in the current practice of, of uh, data science, that if we have a given system in which we have multiple data sets, multiple time series, rather than analyzing each as a solitude, each as its own little world that we study and quantify, etc. It suggests that there's a deep underlying connection between them that can, can lend understanding jointly about the, the system that, that's driving both of them. Um, and that really to make best use of them, we would do well to consider them together because they're just different faces of the same underlying system. They're different facets, different you know, different um, uh, manifestations of the same, uh, th the same underlying set of drivers and, and systems. Uh, and so it points us to a more holistic view of, of what we can learn from data points and, and towards the desire to, to recognize when certain data time series are, are drawn from the same system. Um, we really would do well to reason uh, jointly about them rather than each in isolation. But there's a lot of details to be worked out, and I'd, I'd, uh, I'd like to explicate them a bit um, uh, for the balance of our time together. Okay, um, so we've talked about model state space, and we've noted that models often don't occupy the full extent of their state space, and there's many reasons for that. Um, uh, symmetry, conservation, and coupling. Our, our primary focus right now is on, is on coupling. Um, and uh, because of this coupling, the different variables are entangled with one another. One encodes information about its drivers. Um, and we demonstrated how algebraically within a given perfect knowledge of a given system, we could actually demonstrate that algebraically, that one, the information of one variable, say x, is enough to uniquely determine the value of another variable. Um, um, and it turns out that the same thing is true for for empirical data. And we went through this mechanical process last time whereby we could take a given time series and uh, we could <coughs> undergo a process called embed or delay embedding where given a given given a specific delay that we choose tau maybe it's one maybe it's two in those examples we just saw uh, it was one uh, we were plotting here um, links versus links from one time ago, one time unit ago. For hairs, the same thing. Um, but in general, it could be 10, it could be 20, it could be um, any integer number of points ago in the time series. But it's uniform across um, for, for each element of a vector. So for a given point in time, we have from that time series a value, right? Uh, if we have this time series that gives for time zero, one, two, three, four, let's say. Um, uh, for each time point, it gives a value, y of t. And what embedding does is for each time point, it creates a vector. A vector of length given by the embedding dimension e. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I strongly dislike the fact that I said N there, and I'm going to attempt to change it, probably fruitlessly. Um, alas, it's a picture, and it forces me, so I'm going to shove it on the board. Uh, I prefer to write it as as uh, 
using this notation uh, because we'll come back to this notion of e many times in this lecture and coming ones. y of t, y of t minus tau, so that's that delay, right? Um, this is a, a vector. So for a given time point where we have one value y of t originally, we're going to create a vector. And I have a vector. It's going to be a vector in this reconstructed state space, this, this uh, shadow manifold as constructed from y. Uh, so, so for a given time point t, where we used to have just a single value y of t, we're going to have a vector of length e. And it's going to be y, y of t minus tau, uh, excuse me, 2 tau, um, y of t minus 3 tau, up to da, 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 up to y of t minus anyone? E, what is tau? e minus 1 tau, right? Um, because if e were 1, the only one would be uh, y of t. What are tau? In this tau is the uh, the embedding delay, it's called. So it's some integer, it's some positive integer. Um, uh, so, in fact, you'd say, therefore, it's a natural number. It's uh, so tau, tau is drawn from n. Um, so it's one, two, three, four, and it it uh, is called the embedding delay. So, so each of these, so again, for each time point, t, we're getting a vector of length e because we're going to have a reconstructed state space of dimension e. It's going to have e dimensions in it. So there's going to be, you know, it's an e-dimensional space that we're reconstructing. Uh, um, so this is the reconstructed, we're going to call it. Uh, uh, state space, okay, uh, of the system, and it's going to be of dimension e, okay. This is, and we're going to be reconstructing points in that state space. Each, for a given time, we're going to get this vector, and that is going to be one point in this state space. And for for each t, we're going to get a different vector, right? For each point, we're going to get a different vector within the, the state space, right? And collectively, the set of those vectors within this reconstructed state space, or phase space, the, recon the, the, the set of these data points is going to be called the shadow manifold, okay? And we're going to label it by the time series from which it was reconstructed. So this is going to be the reconstructed manifold, the reconstructed sort of uh, uh, trajectories in state space like this. These are, re these are shadow manifolds as reconstructed from hairs on the left and links, ladies and gentlemen, on the right. So then we're going to label this so the shadow manifold M for, for manifold sub the name of the time series that gave rise to it, Y. Okay? That's the shadow manifold. Okay? So each point in the time series, modulo some boundary issues, you know, it's too early in the time series, you're not going to be able to have one that's one before it or two before it. Um, but ignoring that, each point in the time series is going to yield a vector in this reconstructed state space, and collectively they will form trajectories uh, in what's called the shadow map. Now, Alex, we're going to be discussing the choice of embedding delay because actually it's going to have a significant impact on the shape of the shadow manifold. And we'll see that in just a few minutes. Okay?
Okay, so this is reconstructed space. So yes, Alex. Why would it change the shape? Wouldn't it just be a greater gas? I'll get to that. I'd like you to ponder that for the moment. Why would it affect the shape? It's actually a very good reason it will affect the shape that wasn't immediately obvious to me when I started doing this work. And you'll, we'll come to why that is. Uh, it has to do with how quickly Y is changing over time versus how quickly uh, the, the length of delay in bedding. Um, and if Y is changing very slowly over time, Y of T will be very similar to Y of T minus 1, Y of T minus 2, Y of T minus 3. And therefore, this shadow manifold that we reconstruct will tend to be on the diagonal, right? It's like the first element of it, and the second element, and the third element, and the fourth element, all be pretty similar, so be sort of living on the diagonal. The diagonal is where the first element of the vector is the same as the second, same as the third, same as the fourth, right? Like, right? Plot this. Like, if I drew the diagonal here along the three dimensions, something like that, right? This is this is I'm running out of letters, but uh, you know I'm trying to avoid committing calling this X Y Z because we've already used Y. Um, this the diagonal is by definition something where this coordinate equals that coordinate equals that coordinate, and if Y is varying very slowly. then these successive things will be very equal and, and, and the reconstructed shadow manifold will tend to live in the diagonal. On the other hand, if it, if Y is changing very slowly, or sorry, very quickly rather, compared to tau, it'll tend to spread out. And we'll see this in more, more detail. Okay. Um, okay, but let's let's uh, continue on here and we'll come back to that. Um, okay, now I'm going to come back to this issue. But I gave an example from last time. This is uh, you know, an intriguing example which actually arose at um, in uh, what's now Earth and Planetary Sciences at MIT um, by an uh, atmospheric physicist called uh, uh, Edward Lorenz, not to be confused with uh, Lorenz Conrad Curve. Lorenz. Sorry? Lorenz Curve, Lorenz, not that one. Um, Lorenz curve yeah. could be the same Lorenz curve actually, but it's different from the Edward Lorenz or Conrad Lorenz, who who studied neurotic behavior in geese among other things. Um, <laughs> it's a very interesting, it's a, a very interesting story I can tell you, but uh, there's not time to do it right now. But um, ab about uh, phobias in geese. Um, so. Um, uh, so the Lorenz attractor, he was modeling, I think, convection in the atmosphere and uh, had a model with three state variables in it, x, y, and z. And uh, uh, this model was physically grounded. It was based on a mechanistic understanding of how the atmosphere um, uh, interacts in a, in a simpler way. But what he found is that it, it exhibited behavior over, over time which was not recognizably associated with uh, clear patterns. So, so if we look at X, for example, you see this behavior over time that that's, um, seems like it has some structure, some regularity in it, but it seems like it has a, a great deal of almost random kind of intermixing of these these building blocks or patterns. Um, it, it seems to be this weird balance between order and randomness up here in X. And the same thing is true in Y and Z. Um, and it turns out that this system is moreover numerically chaotic. So if you start just a little bit apart, it, the, the differences between the trajectories will, will tend to be amplified over time. Um, the corresponding diagram here um, 
uh, in uh, state space as, as reconstructed from x, y, and z, however, exhibits all the order in the world. So, so the time series looks quasi-random, but if you actually plot out the structure of the system that underlies this time series, that's whispered to us by any one of these time series, as it turns out, there's actually an orderliness to it. There's a, there's a defined structure. There's a, a clear thing there that has well-defined structure and is kind of has a, uh, has a, you know, a visually parsable sort of meaning to it. Um, but what's notable is that, um, you know, you can also reconstruct these things from any one of these. You can, you can reconstruct the same, the same system. I show here x versus y and y versus z and, and, um, and uh, x versus z. But here they are reconstructed uh, on the lower side from, uh, from x versus previous x or y versus previous y or z versus previous z. Okay? Um, and so these lower ones, these upper ones um, are, are reconstruction repairs of the actual state variables as if we knew each state variable with perfect clarity the value it has over time. So it would be as if you know, at a certain time uh, say the time with the dotted line, we measured the value of x, of y, and z, and we, we plotted it in this green curve there. Or we measure x and y, the purple and the blue, I guess. I don't know. Um, and we, we plot it in this one uh, down here in the lower left. Um, that's like a God's eye view of it. It's like a, you, know, you have a full view. By contrast, we could reconstruct from a single variable using this delay embedding uh, as defined over there. And what we'd find is something that is the same basic information. It's just sort of stretched or twisted in some defined way. But it captures the, the fundamental regularities underlying it. So from what looks random here, we get out something that's ordered. Mm -hmm. My Latin fails me. Um, I know out of many, one is e pluribus unum. Um, I'm not sure out of chaos order, I'm not sure how to say that, or out of, out of uh, uh, entropy order in Latin. But, um, but here we here we have the reconstructed system. Um, I would note that if you plot this out, you will find that it's uh, it's plotting each point in some sort of intermixed way. It doesn't immediately draw it out in a in a perfect way. You may get this point and then this one and then this one and it sort of hops around um, as you reconstruct it, but but it'll actually give a depiction. So this is in two D. This is in three D. And you could rotate this thing around and see the three-dimensional structure indicated here from only one of these. So these things are whispering to us of everything that's driving them, just as the hairs are whispering to us about how many links there are in the links in there are meowing to us about the, uh, the, the number of hairs around. Okay, that, that wasn't as appealing, I guess. But... Um, <laughs> uh, so, for time series, we can draw out um, the shadow manifold that's, uh, that's depicted. And this was a system built by a student um, a couple years back, uh, Amin, who, uh, who basically took, um, uh, he, he built a little interface so that you could reconstruct from a time series a given shadow manifold and you could select different pieces of that time series and see the corresponding sort of um, corresponding window shown here in blue of the shadow manifold because this can turn into a particular thing um, uh, to, a, to a particular uh, particular piece. Um, and I think here, uh, um, yes, I think 
I think this x and y down here led to reconstructions. Yes, this is, so if you look at x down here, mind you, it's, you know, I, I, if I had my druthers, I'd zoom into it. But um, uh, if you look at x, for example, x, if you plot out x versus x at time t minus, um, it's, it's some longer delay here, 180 or something, and x at time t minus 360 or something, um, you will see this sort of structure behind it. It looks like a whole bunch of sort of random transitions here, but there's this orderliness to it. There's a, there's a you know, clear object, a clear sort of underlying um, regularity that underlies that. And similarly for Y, we get a sort of shape in, uh, in reconstructed state space, okay? Um, so again, given a time series Y, for each time point, modulo the, the edge ones, we, um, we reconstruct a set of vectors in some e-dimensional space. We plot them in that e-dimensional space and thereby we're plotting the reconstructed shadow manifold for the driving components of the system, the parts of the system that are driving that time series. So if we start with time series Y and we construct it, we're asking to reconstruct the state space of the system that's driving Y, okay? Um, okay, that's where we're going. Um, so in general, we don't know what those, what these, state variables are. We don't, we don't have this God's eye view that we know the relevant state variables are these. We may have limited theorizing about the system, but we can still reconstruct that state space, okay? Um, that's the, the, prospect, uh, the prospect here. Okay, so let's talk about the influence of tau um, in response to Alex's question. I, I, I will confess to you that I like to use, um, so I'm told that Chris Duchin in his lectures, that he has a different lecture style than, uh, than my own. And I'm told that he's extremely effective at emphasizing certain points because he'll stand at the same place for long periods of time. And when there's a, a transition of great significance, great gravity, he will shift one step to the right, <laughs> or one step to the left. And uh, that's a different style than my own, which Jeff, for which Jeff outfitted in my first boot camp in Australia, what he called the bear pit, um, in which I would wander. Um, and people around me could, could watch my um, peripatetic meanderings. Um, look that up. Um, so, so meanderings, yeah. Sort of uh, a meander is sort of a quasi-random walk over. Brownian motion? No. Well, uh, you might call slow Brownian motion a meander. It suggests a sort of um, slower level of uh, slower pace of walking too. It suggests a leisurely sort of walking, and not a not a run. Not, uh, and some random walks exhibit faster evolution. Um, in any case, um, I'm not without my points of uh, of wanting to emphasize things, and I, I you know, through through uh, hand motions or by you know hitting on surfaces or tossing my glasses, which have a have a uh, memory frame uh, for many years, um, I can I can make points. Now, Jeff. Jeff McDonald, to go back to our Australian uh, colleague, says that the best, the best person you ever met for this, for emphasizing things, um, he actually said he was a, he was a, a technical salesman or something. And it sounded like a guy I wouldn't want to meet, but he said that his presentation, he would time things to sort of build up audience excitement, and then at a certain point, he would, <laughs> he would, he he came in with like a suit jacket on and tie, and then at a certain point he would like rip them off, 
and say, let me tell you the real situation. And he'd make them feel like he was, he was really, you know, um, sharing internal secrets with them and so on, and make them feel a strong sense of trust, which, of course, he would do for every customer. And so I, I view it as quasi-abusive behavior, but um, Jeff said it was completely, it was like a wild degree of mastery of, of sort of the dramatic moment. And I haven't yet, um, or uh, I, I don't think I'll go that direction, either in life <laughs> or in my lectures. But uh, but the point is, a bit of uh, a bit of dramatic uh, attention setting is important um, to draw a students' attention at times. And and something to think about here in this kind of sub module we're about to talk about is the effect of tau. Um, what is the effect of tau? on embedding. So Alex asked that question. Like, why choose one tau versus uh, another? Um, tau is left unspecified here, and in, in theory, any of them should work. In theory. Um, so why choose one tau versus another? On what principles might we choose? By which, by which principles might we choose tau? Judiciously. Um, and the reflection here is that, in theory, any work, any any natural number of tau, in practice, um, there's there's very good reasons to select one versus another, and it has to do with the point I made um, uh, quickly before. Okay, so it has to do with the relative rate of evolution of the underlying system's dynamics how quickly y is changing over time uh, and and that will end up shaping tau and specifically if y is changing very quickly over time so y of t versus y of t plus 1 plus y of t plus 2 for example are very different you probably want to tell that small y no pun intended y um, so that y of t and uh, y of t minus 1 and y of t minus 2, um, for them to be different doesn't require any, any large value of tau. Using tau equals 1 is fine. We said y of t and y of t minus 1 will be quite different, for example. And, you know, it, it kind of is nice if we can sample nearby points within our state vectors, kind of from nearby points. But it doesn't have to be small, but it can be. We, we do ourselves no disservice, ladies and gentlemen, by choosing tau equals 1 if y is changing quickly. Uh, tau equals 1 is, is, is fully adequate for our needs. And indeed, if you choose tau that's too large, you're going to be truncating, you're going to be throwing away data. Imagine tau being 10,000. What's the earliest point that you could choose? Let's suppose there's only two, y of t and y of t minus tau. What's the earliest point you could choose? Suppose your time series start, as is a long time convention in computer science with, with y, of, y of zero. If you have tau equals 10,000, what's the earliest time point from which you could start reconstructing these, these, uh, these uh, shadow vect vectors in the shadow manifold? 10,000. So you basically cut off your ability to make use of those early data points within the time series. By contrast, if y equals 1 and, and you're, you're, you have a two-dimensional, e equals 2, you have a two-dimensional shadow manifold that you're reconstructing, or sorry, I should say that again. Your, your reconstructed state space is in e equals 2, is in two dimensions. So each reconstructed point in the shadow manifold is y of t and y of t minus 1, you could start using the time series at t equals 1, the second point. You could start to reconstruct these. So the larger tau is, the more you're throwing away data. However, let's consider a situation where tau, uh, where, where y is changing very slowly, shall we not? If y is changing very slowly, it's, it takes hundreds of points for y to materially change. y of t, y of t minus 1, y of t minus 2 are going to be very, very similar. y of t minus 3. And if we plot them in an e-dimensional state space, 
they're going to all lie on this diagonal that where each of their coordinates is going to be basically the same. And, and that's going to impede understanding. So you could see it a little bit shown here. These plots may have been created when you wrote SLED um, in your earlier years. Um, I did a, perhaps an ungainly amount of this of experimentation with this. Um, uh, so here's tau equals one. This is from an actual shadow manifold uh, through, uh, I think it was maybe from a measles model. I'm trying to remember. Um, in any case, um, t equals one. Here, so, we, so this upper left, you'll notice points are pretty close to the, uh, to the diagonal here. They're all sort of clustered around the diagonal, right? Because t is very similar to t minus one, very similar to t minus two, very similar to t minus three. By contrast, if we go to t equals two, it kind of expands some. Check out t equals four. It's getting more fulsome. And things that were compressed as just, just being fringes on the, on, around, this, um, around this diagonal turn into things that look like trajectories, uh, excursions. Yes, Alex? Is E the same length in all of these? E's, e is three here. Um, so E, great question, E is the same. There are three. One for each of these. Good question. Excellent question. And I should have said this. This is with E equals to three. Capital E equals three. And the reason we can tell this visually um, is that there's three dimensions shown in this uh, this reconstructed state space here. Okay, so so uh, there's one dimension along this axis, one along that axis, and one along that. Um, so, so here we have E equals three. So the, the reconstructed state space is in dimension three. Um, the, state, the space, the reconstructed space is of dimension three. That doesn't mean the shadow manifold is of dimension three. We need to we need to distinguish between those. The shadow manifold may be a thin wedge within that space, so it's sort of a, a thin object, or it may be a sort of pudgy object in that space. Um, it could be either one, but um, but the the reconstructed state space uh, is if, as of dimension three. Hence, the three uh, dimensions associated with this box. Um, so. The yes. value of tau depends on what I'm measuring, right? Like yes. I'm deciding, for That's example, right. if I'm measuring weight, then That's the tau should be larger if it's the daily model. Correct. Beautiful. That's a great example. So if you're, if you have a, if you have someone's weight yeah. over time, maybe this is empirical data on someone's weight over time, right? And you're measuring that daily, yeah. or to be absurd, absurd about it, hourly, yeah. right? then it's very likely that my weight from yesterday is very similar to my weight now. Um, you know, maybe there's a bit of modifications over Thanksgiving or something like that, right? Um, uh, but, but it's pretty, it's, it's pretty, um, um, pretty slow varying. But so if I'm measuring blood glucose, then right. measuring Correct. every hour should... Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. And and the truth is, the beauty is, you could be measuring it here less frequently. Like, I could be measuring blood glucose once a day um, or once a week. If I do it for a long period of time, I can still reconstruct the state space in theory, which is interesting. Um, uh, now, there's some subtleties about that that you and I could discuss, but. Uh, Concerning the internal dynamics within a day, you're measuring at the same time of day or different times. Like you'd want to probably measure at random times during the day. Maybe at the government send you a reminder, like do it now. But the point is, um, uh, if if it's something that's very slow changing, like weight, then uh, then you will tend to if you use tau equals one, it will tend to be on this diagonal. 
you know, and it will actually visually obscure things that are really brought up. Like take take a look at tau equals sixteen here. What you see, and even with tau equal four and eight, what you see is a lot more structure to things. There's there's some parts, um, particularly with these trajectories looping around it. Those are actually indicative of uh, feedbacks within the system. Remember, this is, is state space, so there's something that may be going in this direction, then it's pulled back, just like that's pulled back. It's kind of a feedback going on where it's yanked back and, and pulled back towards the system, um, much as you might see in, um, you know, in a system where you have uh, you know, S, I, and R, right? Um, S, I, and R, you might see sort of loops in towards a, a you know, towards a, a stable point. Um, so, um, you also see, you may note that there's actually some locality here, like if you look, there's kind of blotches of green, red, and, and yellow that aren't so obvious in this one up here. But it, it, it's kind of got some local continuity or something associated with it. Um, so um, tau does matter for insight. And if we reconstruct, remember, all this is, what we're looking up here is coming from a single time series. That's all it's coming from, reconstructing this way. And a tau equals, a larger tau here is more insightful to elicit the underlying structure that's driving that time series. Does that make sense? It's, this is, there is some state space that's driving it where this is a reconstruction. Now, I want to go back, Alex, as normal, is asking very, very good questions. One might even say prescient questions. Um, he did not hear that compliment. Um, uh, so, one thing that he asked about is E here. How did I know to choose E? Why did I choose the particular E here? The, the fact is, we often um, do not know what E is, right? We, we engage in this reconstruction in some state space, reconstructed state space dimension E, not knowing which E is most appropriate. And this will turn out to be a very significant point when it comes to CCF. If we choose an E that's too small, we will end up dealing with projections of some, of some order down to a given thing. So maybe, maybe and, and this is where, you know, my you know, my, not only my penmanship, but my, my artistic abilities will shock you, probably. Well, in a, in a shock and disappoint. Um, but, you know, if, if, we, um, if we were to have a, uh, you know, a structure here, and I'm, I'm trying to imagine it, um, uh, if we were to have a a structure, okay, this is gonna be a person, there we go. Okay, this is, this is a memorable thing, I, uh, okay. Uh, okay, here's a person, um, they're gonna be embedded in, in 3D space, okay? Um, um, right, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, so here's, here's a person um, which we might, we might visualize in uh, 3D space, but um, uh, if we were projected down to a single dimension from below, what we might see is, well, single dimension, um, that's gonna be like projecting it onto this line. All we would see is like a segment here of a line, right? Um, with a, a, a greater chance of falling in here than here, or something like that. There'd be more points in this region. If we were projected down to a 2D surface, like let's suppose the surface on which this, uh, this young person is standing, um, you know, they would sort of come out into some sort of oval with a, uh, with a, uh, a distribution on it that tends to peak in the center. 
that's not too insightful for the structure here. There's an orderliness to what's going on here that's not really captured. It's kind of mushed together if we project it down into two key dimensions. If we, if we then uh, projected three dimensions, we would see um, this, this figure in all its glory, right? Um, imagine it's Michelangelo's baby. Um, um, to, to, to imagine, ladies and gentlemen, the glory. Um, four dimensions, in four dimensions, we don't really lose anything here. Um, we'd still see the figure would just be in the fourth dimension. It wouldn't be exercising any change in the fourth dimension. It will be a figure of, of uh, you know, of persistence, say, in the fourth dimension. Fifth dimension, we don't really lose anything. So there's a certain requisite number of dimensions to capture the orderliness. Um, beyond that, we, we, we don't gain much, just as in those opening slides of this lecture. Um, you know, we didn't really gain anything going from this to this. It's just we embedded it in a bigger space that we didn't really exploit. It's still intrinsically two-dimensional. And we can put it into a larger space with no real gain. And so choosing a larger E um, can often not be uh, a, big, uh, a big problem. By the way, this is for the Lorenz attractor. Okay, um, and this is this is really kind of interesting, and I don't have a I, I I don't have a clear lesson to talk about for for all of these, but um, I'm intrigued by what we see at tau equals four and tau equals eight. That actually suggests that if tau is too big, you can start getting effects concerning the sampling interacting with the evolution of the system that are kind of artifactual. Um, and this has to do with beating effects, et cetera, that I, I won't go into, but uh, Wade may have heard of uh, in, the, in yonder building in engineering some years ago. Um, OK, so why do we build this embedded space? Why do we do this? OK, so this is kind of a curious thing. And, and it is appealing at some level that things from the world that may look random or semi-random have an orderliness behind them. There's something fundamentally appealing, I think, about that. The things that seem to be neither here nor there, they're, they're just happenstance, they're just you know, weird. Um, there's actually an underlying you know, sort of explanation that's simple, powerful, orderly. There's a regularity there. That's a very appealing thing. And that's one reason we, we might envision this. But it's not the only one. Another thing that we can do that actually drove us in this direction is to use this to assess dimensionality of a system. So you may recall that I... Um, I talked about this idea that we could use this method of um, assessing dimensionality um, that I described on this floor two times ago. And it involved seeing how the number or the fraction of points um, enclosed in a given ball of radius r scales as R rises. Remember that? I even have with me yet a physical reminder of that experience that I will seek to, to recover if I can. Um, and uh, if I can't, I'll, I'll provide a similar uh, point of lesson. Alas, um, uh, the particular artifact may be gone, but the principle remains. So here's a two-dimensional surface, right, embedded in 3D. We're in a three-dimensional space overall, but this is two dimensions. And 
It's reflecting the fact that if we have a growing ball, you can imagine a, a ball in the center here growing, right? Um, if it doubles in radius, the number of points on this thing, or the fraction of this surface that's included in that ball, the ball radius doubles, the fraction of this thing that's included will go up by a factor of four. Four. Because it's the area that's that's spanned by it. By contrast, if I have a linear object like this, if I have a thing that's a given radius and I double it, the fraction of this cord that lies within that doubling goes up by a factor of two. That's it. And a ball that lies within a, a patently three-dimensional surface, um, you know, within the, the back of this chair, a small ball, when we double it, if it, the radius goes up by a factor of two, the fraction of this chair back that lies within that ball will go up by a factor of eight. Because it's, it's, it's three-dimensional. So we'll It'll span in the three dimensions, right? Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I had talked about how we could use this principle, this principle here, to assess the the intrinsic dimensionality of of an underlying model or of an underlying system um, in the ideas we would sort of assess as radiuses grow here how the fraction of points scale and that would allow us to reason about the dimensionality of this system the underlying system but that posited when we first did it on, on knowledge of each of the, the the state variables and what the embedding does is it provides us another way to get access to something with, with the same dimensionality. So these reconstructed manifolds. Oh, oh this is exciting. That lie, lie uh, before us here, or these reconstructed manifolds here. These have the same intrinsic dimensionality as the underlying state space. They may be compressed, they may be squeezed. They may be contorted in certain ways, but they have the same basic underlying dimensionality as, as the state space itself. So if we assess their underlying dimensionality, uh, if we want to assess the underlying dimensionality of the, the generating system, we can do so from the embedded system. Does that make sense? We can use the embedded system to reconstruct the underlying dimensionality. Um, and in general, the connectedness and the general structure. Now, another use of this, which is very powerful, very powerful, is to predict. And indeed, countless hours have been spent by others worldwide using state space models including reconstructed state space from indicators such as you might get from the stock market or from a real estate market or what have you to reconstruct an underlying system. And then having taken and having knowing about this underlying regularity to use that to predict better what the next point is or how the system is going to trend within the next several time points. So the idea is you use, you don't just look at the time series in and of itself. You reconstruct the underlying state space that's driving it. And given the trajectories you find on that, you plot out where the system is likely going to go next with greater confidence than you could by just curve fitting X. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, let me see if I can bring this point home. 
maybe this is the point where I take off that suit jacket. You know? Um, um, I didn't think I would, I would cover this, but I, um, I think it's a profound point. So I, I, I just want to forgive me for, for emphasizing this. There's an incredible number of, of applications in the world of curve fitting that takes place on one observable. Using a single observable from the world, people seek to project, to forecast, to extrapolate where it's going next by, you know, uh, by, by fleshing out where the line is going. So they see a bunch of data points, you know, on recent sales, and they, they do a, a linear regression, they project it forward into time to try to anticipate where it's going. Or they look at incidence data, right? Um, they look at incidence of, of cases of pertussis or measles, and they try to sort of curve fit to guess where this might be going in the next little bit. It's better than randomly guessing where it might go, but it's, it's an impoverished approach because it treats it treats this time series as a solitude, as as if it's just the the points on the, the time series in isolation that are the relevant things. It's it's kind of like it's um, dealing with this very superficial aspect of the situation. Um, just trying to sort of connect the points here without understanding what's driving them. What are the underlying the underlying um, factors governing the behavior of this system over time. And one way we, we deal with that in our work, in our work and many other modelers who use these mechanistic models, we build models of the underlying system that better explicate, that better characterize the evolution of the system. So instead of just saying, well, you know, diabetes cases within Saskatchewan are rising like this, and we'll fit a curve to it and say they're probably going to rise, you know, like this, or saying, okay, they were going slower now, recently they're faster, Where would, what would happen if we project, and what does that mean in terms of our dialysis capacity planning as more and more diabetics develop the end-stage renal disease? Instead of just curve fitting based on this one observable, one thing we do is we say, wait, wait, wait a minute, this curve is coming from somewhere. This curve is an, is an emergent behavior from an underlying system. We characterize the system in a mechanistic way. We say, well, look, diabetes doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from dynamics associated with aging, risk factors like obesity and overweight. Um, it comes from you know shifts within the population in terms of the number of people uh, who are entering their elder years. And we can do a lot better than just fitting a curve of, of noted diabetic cases by understanding the underlying drivers. So the conviction there is, you know, by understanding the demographics of the population, the risk factors, like having to do with physical activity and sedentary behavior and nutrition and, and intermediate things like weight and, and indeed gestational diabetes um, and uh, factors driving gestational diabetes, older age, having children, etc., um, uh, multi-parity, uh, etc., we can better understand how this curve might evolve than just with curve fitting. That's the idea, right? This, this curve of diabetes, it's dealing with the symptom. Let's reason about the underlying drivers for it, not just reason about this as numbers that should be, have, you know, connect the dots. We, we, can, we can reason about what's driving this. This is just the face, just one aspect of an underlying system and we can do a lot better by characterizing the underlying system and, 
and know in a lot better, with a lot better clarity how that might change given the fact there's all these other changes taking place to encourage physical activity and healthy living and to lower the burden of gestational diabetes, et cetera. So one way we deal with this, um, with this, uh, you know, as a better way to improve things for planning is to build mechanistic models, right? But mechanistic models, ladies and gentlemen, require care and expertise and they require you know, understanding of, of underlying system that's elicited and often develops in a slow fashion. What we see here offers, from the standpoint of prediction, another intriguing possibility. An intriguing possibility that is not without its mechanistic basis, but but doesn't require a full model to to explicate it, to, to elicit it. Ladies and gentlemen, within that time series, within one time series here, X, or within a time series of diabetes, or within a time series of measles or pertussis over time, lies in understanding, lies the information about it. It encodes information about the underlying drivers for it. Whether we construct a model of that or not, it contains this information about its drivers. And people have sought to take advantage of that with prediction by saying, well, look, let's go from the time series. Let's use that time series. Instead of some simplistic way connecting the dots from something that's that's like driven by a very complex system. We instead reconstruct the shadow manifold from this. We can reconstruct a representation of the shadow manifold. And we study that shadow manifold to understand the structure, to understand how trajectories evolve. And we use that information about how trajectories evolve in that shadow manifold to predict what's coming up within, within this time series for that matter, other time series. That's one way people seek to use this embedded reconstruction. It, and, it, and it has to do with the mechanistic understanding that these are the drivers depicted, but it doesn't require building a full model. It doesn't require building a representation mechanistically in the, in the form of a, of a quantitative model so much as it, as it does and, you know, a careful approach to reconstruct underlying state space and to study it. So this is another use of this embedding. It's, it's for prediction. And in fact, Sugihara's work, which we'll be discussing before the, the enlarged section is out, Sugihara's work, ladies and gentlemen, um, has made significant use of prediction. Um, he, he's, he's come at much of it from a prediction standpoint. Um, uh, so I had said visually assess, but you can formally assess dimensionalities we, we've talked about. And the final thing, which I'm going to be emphasizing for most of the balance of the, the session today, is we can use these methods to assess causal drivers within the system. Um, according to this technique of convergent cross mapping, okay, this technique advanced by Sugihara, um, and that's where we're going to be going with it. But you shouldn't lose track of the fact that there's all these other benefits from this reconstruction. Okay, um, so I want to talk about convergent cross mapping. Before I do that. Maybe I'll ask, are there any questions about what I've covered thus far? No? Okay. Um, I will take silence as a sound. That, or as no questions. I will take it as an okay for
for me to proceed. Um, okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk about this very exciting approach of convergent cross mapping. Convergent cross mapping is a technique that has its subtleties. It's rooted in system science and particular dynamical systems techniques. Makes direct and central use of delay embedding and the ideas behind it. But it addresses one of the fundamental needs brought to the fore in the context of artificial intelligence. In the AI space, as we speak here in 2000, late 2019, There's a growing awareness of the need to move AI from a reliance primarily on associational methods, methods that capture patterns as they happen to be generated by today's data generating processes and move it instead in the direction of causal understanding with two primary goals in mind. Goal one, explicability. The capacity to explain why a certain recommendation is made based on, on some AI inference. Two, and in my view, at least as important, the capacity to reason about counterfactuals. Situations which haven't observed, but therefore by definition, where there we have not been able to gather data, but where we need to reason about with confidence. Why do we care about counterfactuals? Let me pose that question to the group. Why do we care about counterfactuals? Why do we care about reasoning about situations we have not observed before? There's a huge reason that decision makers may care about that. And there's other reasons as well. Anyone? Well, one reason is they want to be prepared. They want to be prepared for different eventualities. So they need to plan, you know, suppose there were a terrorist incident in Saskatoon and they want to be prepared for how to respond, right? Um, they want to be prepared if there were a industrial fire um, in the industrial area that started spewing up toxic smoke how would the city respond? Or if there was an overturned truck carrying toxic materials on Circle Drive, how would they respond? Scenario planning um, requires reasoning about counterfactuals often, um, so that we put in place contingency plans or mitigation measures. But there's another reason that's even more fundamental. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we want to bend the curve. We want to change things for the better. And when we want to change things for the better, often we want to change them in ways we haven't observed before. Uh, we want to observe um, an improved situation that's not been previously observed. We want to you know, vaccinate the population um, against HIV or something. That's not yet been done. What would the effects be of that? Or we want to put into place a new measure for lowering the burden of childhood infection by having a school-based response or more effective 
um, outbreak immunization response campaigns that have not yet been tried. We want to reason about the effects of new policy regimes or new interventions. And when, we're, when we do so, we need to reason about, at a causal level, how will certain changes affect things? One might say both affect and effect things. Um, and to, to reason about that with confidence requires understanding of some causality, because we're not talking about patterns from the past. We're talking about how would this new change, which has never been observed, change those patterns, change the burden of illness of pertussis in, in uh, babies or, or young kids, etc. And so those in the AI front are increasingly grappling with causal AI. How do we conduct AI in a way that understands causality? How do we detect causality as part of the picture? And ladies and gentlemen, convergent cross-mapping provides us a way of doing just that. Okay? So convergent cross-mapping provides us a means of, of assessing for two variables in a system, whether there's indirect or direct causation extending, let's call those variables x and y, the loss of generality, from x driving y, or y driving x, or x and y driving each other, or neither driving either. Okay? Um, it also provides as a secondary and I would say less confident or less useful measure, some quantification of the strength of such a relationship. L uh, less useful because it, it's hard to compare it to, to other things. Okay? Um, so convergent cross-mapping uh, is an approach that uses time series, two time series, requires two time series, x and y. Here we have one time series that we, from which we reconstruct the shadow manifolds. With convergent cross mapping, we'll be dealing with two. Okay? And for simplicity for the balance of this uh, lecture, I will assume that they're measured at the same time points. Say so both are measured weekly or daily. Okay? Um, now, convergent cross mapping is an approach that operates on, that is conscious of the underlying state space, okay? And a key issue here is it reconstructs that state space from both X and Y. But I, I slightly distort the matter because it's not necessarily reconstructing the same state space. From X, it's reconstructing in order to assess whether X is driving Y, Y is driving X, uh, both driving each other or neither, it will reconstruct the state space from X, and it will reconstruct the state space from Y, and, uh, and they may or may not be the same state space, because maybe some of the factors affecting X are not factors affecting Y, and vice versa. Okay, um, and for most of the discussion, we are going to focus on the question of one way of causality, so X driving Y, knowing that we can flip it around, okay? Um, so uh, for the most part, we're going to be asking if Y is driving X, okay? So is Y driving, causally driving It may be covariant with X, it may rise and fall with X, but is it merely a statistical fluke, or is it in fact driving it? That's the key question, okay? Um, and the basic deal here is we are going to reconstruct shadow manifold using that time series. So if you want to assess if X if y is driving x, we are going to 
reconstruct the state space from X. Okay, this is the shadow manifold. And we're then going to go through a process of basically assessing if information about Y is encoded in that reconstructed state space. And to motivate this, I've never done this before, but I'd like to I'd like you to think about it because I find it useful. Let's talk about the reconstruction of the shadow manifold as reconstructed from X. Okay, I am going to, to prevent confusion here because my slides are one convention or another. I am going to talk about reconstructing it from X. So to prevent confusion, I'm going to talk about M sub X and our embedding is going to be X, X of what? T minus tau, you know, I, I, for a given time point in X, given time point T, um, we are going to, we have a single point in X, right? X of T. But for that time point, we're going to reconstruct a vector which lies in the reconstructed state space of dimension E. That's that is going to be of this form. It's the embedding uh, from this time series. So its first element is x of t, its second element is x of t minus tau, its third element is x of t minus 2 tau, uh, t minus 3 tau, and t minus e minus 1 tau. Okay. So for every time point t, except for the modulo of the ones near the edge, we're going to reconstruct a vector of this sort. And I argued before that that's going to create a shadow manifold. You see it right here for this case. Right? There's our shadow manifold that's reconstructed from lengths, for example. It's our shadow manifold as reconstructed from hairs. And it's, it's shadowing. It's kind of a, a shadow of of the underlying state space that driving links here or driving hairs here, okay. Um, so we're going to be creating the shadow manifold, and we're going to be then reasoning about whether Y is in the shadow manifold. So I'm going to make an utterance now. And it's an utterance that's going to have great significance with respect to understanding CCM. So please pay attention. So this shadow reconstructed shadow manifold <coughs> is reconstructing the state space driving X. That's what we're doing here. This, ladies and gentlemen, is reconstructing the state space driving hairs. That's what that is. It's a reconstruction of the state space driving hairs. This one to the right is reconstruction of the state space of things driving lynxes. Now it turns out that in this system, the state space driving hairs involves lynx. In the state space driving lengths involves hair. So we end up seeing sort of shadows of, or whispers of, or, or sort of descriptions of the same underlying state space. But in general, that's not necessarily true. That, that it may be that, for example, hair's population is driven by somewhat different things directly than. Uh, uh, than, than is length. So, uh, for example, the uh, 
uh, the, the hare population might also be driven by other predators. Um, so for example, uh, wolves or coyotes or, or birds of prey might also drive the hare population. Um, humans might hunt hares in the way that they don't, well, they hunted lynx as well. Um, but uh, there may be you know, other factors involving grass and availability of food sources that affect length, uh, affect hares in a way that's somewhat different than length. So, in general, if we if we plot out the shadow manifold for hares, shadow manifold that's reconstructed from hares, it's going to have dimensions associated with it that reflect the drivers for the hair population. So uh, just humor me this. There's going to be a dimension within this state reconstructed state space. If there's a variable that's driving hairs, um, there's going to be some way in which the hair population will will depend on that, um, and and it may be that as one gets larger values of the variables, there's more of that variable. There's more hairs and small. Maybe it's food availability and fewer. There's there's fewer hairs, but it's a driver, and therefore it's part of the dimensionality of this of reconstructed state space. That you know, as as the food availability varies, so it is that hairs vary. Um, so the reconstructed space space for hairs would encode the information about the availability of, you know, of this food source or the plentifulness of, um, you know, how many hawks are around or how many eagles or how many, um, how many bears or wolves. Okay. So when we reconstruct the state space from a given from a given uh, uh, time series associated with a given observable, um, what we're getting is a reconstructed state space of the things that drive that. And conceptually, there will be a, um, a dimension in it for things that are driving this and things that are not materially driving it won't tend to have a dimension associated with them. Okay. Um, so, it, it bears noting that um, if we have to think about the state space that is driving hairs or that is driving X here, this states, this time series from which we're reconstructing it, um, that state space will encode things, will have as almost as a dimension things on which that hairs are causally dependent and not things on which it's not uh, causally dependent, okay? And this is going to play a key, key role in this analysis for CCM. Um, because what we're going to be looking at is whether closeness of, of uh, points in state space in this reconstructed state manifold is going to yield consistent values for the values of of this um, of, of a given variable say of y we're trying to assess is y driving x if having nearby points in state space of x of the shadow manifold of x gives us very similar values of y it suggests y is encoded in the state space it therefore must be one of the factors that's driving the state space causally um, because uh, its its information is is associated with the state of X um, by contrast, or the underlying state of the system that's driving X, I should say. By contrast, if the value of Y is all over the map for different nearby points in state space, it suggests to us that Y is not an element of the state of the system driving X. Y is just not part of this, um, this that state of that system driving X, uh, which is indicated by locality in the state space. 
things with similar state of the system driving X are close together in the state space. And if Y has totally different values for those, it suggests it's not driving X. Um, okay, so that's, that's the basic uh, gist of where we're going, okay? Um, so I want to observe further to that point something about the shadow manifolds uh, for X here, okay? Um, okay. Let's talk about the shadow manifold of X. Two points, consider two points close together in the shadow manifold for X. Consider this shadow manifold, for example. There's the shadow manifold reconstructed from hairs, right? Consider two points here. Maybe, maybe right about, you know, uh, right about 5,000 for, for Harris at the current time and 4,500, uh, excuse me, and 5,500 for those one time point ago. Are all the points at that location from the same point in time? No, they're not. The system's actually going around and around um, uh, over time. I mean, you can, you might actually be able to, to see it here, um, uh, but you, you can actually see it sort of building this up. The points that are close to this over time, uh, or for this one for that matter, come from very different points in time. What do they share? What do they share? What do all these points that are nearby each other in the system share? Similar model state. Similar model state, or let me refine that way, because you're absolutely on mark, but it, it requires a bit of model, a, a bit of refinement, because it's similar state of the system that is driving hairs here. And here, that's model state because the whole model is driving hairs here. By contrast, if we had something in this model that was not driving hairs, but was affecting, it was driving lynxes, um, that, that wouldn't be material. That wouldn't necessarily be the same for this point in space because it, it's not germane. You know, just like time is, you can think of time weirdly as an aspect of state, but that's that's not material here. You get, you get points layered from different times. There might be, you know, I'm trying to think of something that would affect lynxes, um, but not hairs. Um, maybe it's the prevalence of some lynx-based disease, right? Um, uh, th that wouldn't be encoded in the, in the hair population directly because it's, it's minimally driving hair. So, so these points here, they don't, they're not sharing the same time. They're sharing the same state of the system driving hairs. Hmm? Same state of the elements of the system driving hairs. That's what's the same at this point. And over here, these nearby points? Are they from the same time point? By no means. They're from all different times. But what they share is the same state of the parts of the system that are driving lynxes. That's why they're at the same point in the reconstructed state space. Remember, this is reconstructed from lengths, right? This is reconstructed from hairs. So the fact that these are overlapped here suggest that whatever is driving links has got to be the same at this at these points these these points are very different points in time they may be very different seasons of the year or, you know uh, with respect to the number of other animals around or the 
the you know the food sources of voles or 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 you know uh, uh, or or rainbow trout, but what they share is is the state of the system driving links is basically the same. Okay, we okay with that? It's a key intuition, key intuition if you're going to understand this. So, what defines closeness? in state space is similarity in the things driving X here, the, the, the time series from which we're reconstructing uh, this, this shadow manifold. Um, and that is going to be a key intuition for understanding how this all works. Okay? Um, okay. So, so again, Follow my reasoning on this if you can. If we want to assess is Y driving X or not? Is Y driving X or not? If, if Y is driving X, if it's part of the state of the system that's affecting X, If we're at nearby points in the state space, as reconstructed from X, we should have similar values of Y. Because that point in that reconstructed state space means that the system is in the same state with respect to affecting Y. So that, if Y is, is driving X, those nearby points in state space should, should have similar values of Y. And in particular, if we consider the value of y at time y of t, at time t, which is you know contemporaneous with this x of t, they should all have similar values of y. The nearby points to to the state space vector reconstructed at time t should all have values of y similar to y of t. Right? Look, if, if this shadow manifold is capturing the state of the system that's affecting x, and if we know, we know the value of y for one of those points, call it the point at time t. If we consider the point at time t, we know the value of x at that time, x of t. And we know the value of y at that time, y of t. And if we consider the state space vector at that time, reconstructed at that time, that red point there, that's the state space vector as reconstructed at time t, right? And we consider other nearby points in state space, not in time, state space, as reconstructed from x. This is m sub x. We consider other points in state space nearby. Those, by definition, will have nearby state of the things affecting x. If y is affecting x, those should have nearby values for y, right? So those nearby points, those little green points around this red point, should have similar values to y as the red point, because they're close in state space. They're close in the, in the things that matter to x, the things that are driving x. Yes, the shot. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a little bit confused. So that means in the model, no matter what models, as long as we get one x, there should be only one y. It's not possible one x with several different values of y, or one y with different values of x. Good question. Okay, so what we're depicting here is not for a model, right? There's no... Uh, okay, so 
I can understand your question at several different levels. And forgive me, I'm trying to understand at what level it was asked. Okay. So what we're showing here is a reconstruction of the state space from X. For X. For, well, from X, yes. We're reconstructing it from X, right? And there could be a model behind this. There could be no model. This could be, you know, lynxes and hares from northern Manitoba, from the Hudson Bay Company. This could be, you know, uh, housing prices from Calgary. This could be a reconstructed from, um, you know, populations of Lake Sturgeon in the Saskatchewan Basin. Um, uh, this could be number of cases of measles per week in Saskatoon or whatever, right? Um, so there might or might not be a model associated with this. Um, and maybe no one's modeled it. But this reconstructed state space will still be there because we're, we're asking about patterns in the underlying you know, system that are, that are encoded in the data. This pattern is just using a different lens to look at this data. It's just looking at this data with a different way of displaying it. It's a mechanical transformation between it. This is not about a model so much as about what's it, the patterns in this data. And in fact, you know, patterns here are a particular point of data. Um, but I thought I heard a different question um, uh, from that potentially, which is, okay, so maybe it's the case that, that X depends on Y, but maybe it depends on it in a, a way that's not sort of one-to-one -one or something like that. Maybe it depends, maybe, you know, X will have similar, Y will have similar impact on X if Y is, um, is uh, you know, two different values. So, so maybe really, really high Y and really, really low Y, uh, in which case, the points around here um, may be uh, may have a mixture of of x's because they they have to do with uh, uh, th they remember how y is driving x, but they 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 don't differentiate between really really high y and really really low y. Okay, so. There's a subtle answer here that I'll try to allude to, but I'm not going to be able to do it justice, okay? So let me, let me give an example of something like that. Maybe the population of hares are affected by weather. Maybe that's one of the, the factors, right? And by temperature, maybe most directly. Um, and um, maybe, you know, in the spring and the fall, um, they both have similar temperature regimes, like similar temperature profiles, uh, in the sense of at a given time, it might be, you know, middling temperature, right? It might be sort of middle temperature. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe those are the times the snowshoe hairs are exposed because their coat's the wrong color or something like that, right? They're still brown and it's snowy outside. Or maybe it's, maybe they are white and all the snow is melted <laughs> and they're hopping around like goats, right? Um, uh, it, it, you know, in a way that's really exposed. If possible. Um, So in that case, though, I would expect it not, 
it not just to be the state of the system driving it isn't just the current temperature it's the direction the temperature is changing or the sort of um, season of the year in which case I would actually argue that probably the springtime points would be at a different place than the than the fall points, the, the autumn points, um, in terms of state. They'd be somewhat different because one is kind of going one way, one is going the other way. So you're right that like temperature might be the same, but the state of the system is more than temperature. Like like when we hit spring, the system knows that it's warming up. Right? It doesn't just like stop there and just randomly do things dictated at that temperature. It's actually, it's part of the state of the system that it's, it's the season when it's warming up or it's the season when it's cooling down. And so I would argue that probably those would be somewhat separated in state space. Um, so I don't think, in short, if it affects it in two places, I would expect it to actually have more state associated with driving it than just that variable. It would be needing to know where that variable is in its, its um, trajectory that would change it one way or the other. Um, but this is a question I'd like to talk about offline because I, I think it, it has some subtleties and I think my intuition is sound here, but I'd want to I want to talk more about it. In short, it's not just, just because there's a, Y has a certain value that, for Y if the same value, it affects X the same way. That's not the fullness of the dependence on Y. Like, like part of state may also be, is Y going up or is Y going down right now? Remember, just as we saw way back here, um, here, we can determine the value of y from x, but it's not just from the value of x right now. It's the value of x and the rate of change of x. Those two jointly tell how it determines y. And you might argue, you know, at a given level of, of prey of hairs, the impact on y is the same, right? Like, like um, for a given number of hairs around, uh, the, the lynxes are going to be similar levels of feeding. Like, they'll be able to get similar numbers of prey, right? They'll be able to catch similar numbers of hairs around. If there's, if, if, if I'm a lynx, and I have 10 hours around per length, I'm going to be similarly fed or something like that. But, but what this is actually saying is that, it's actually not that, it's, it's um, uh, Y is actually, it, it, in as much as it determines Y, it's not just X, but the, the rate of change of X that's relevant. And I think this is true, like when you say, even though, we might think of temperature, the same temperature whether it's spring or fall as affecting the lengths in the same way, or the hairs in the same way. In fact, I would argue the state, uh, the relevant state is probably more than that. It's probably the rate of change which has to do with differently if it's in spring or fall. So anyway, uh, we could talk more about it offline if you're interested. Um, okay. Um, right. Um, Okay, okay. Um, right. Um, okay, now consider closer points here. Okay, consider these green dots, these close points in state space that are close to the red dot. Those are points which have similar values to the state driving x. And if that includes y, 
then then you would think that these will lead to closer information about y to the to the y associated with the red dot. Um, and if the ones if they're further away, if if y is driving x, if we consider green dots further away, those will tend to be associated with values of y that are less close to y of t, the red dot, to the value of y associated with the red dot. Okay, so so as we go from closer points, points that are more tightly clustered around the red dot in terms of the values of these uh, these green dots, from points that are closer in state space to points that are further in state space, will tend to have a lower level of similarity for values of y for those further ones if y is driving x. Okay, so. Um, Closeness in state space means, if y is driving x, closer in state space means closer values of y, is, is my point, okay? Um, uh, now, I, I should say, if y is not driving x, we don't expect information about y to be captured here. And closeness in value of, of the state driving x might be quite uncorrelated are quite different from the value of, uh, of, of, of the values of y associated with those nearby points to it in, in uh, state space reconstructed from x might have very little similarity to the value of y for the, for the red point. Okay? Um, that's, that's the fundamental idea. So we have a point P and we're considering these points near it. If, if x is not dependent on y, those nearby points, which capture similar similar state in terms of how it affects x, if y is not affecting x, they could have values of y that are all over the map, is the idea. Mm. I will further note that the closest points to this red dot in state space may have values of x of t that are different from this one. So the closest value in state space may be in a direction of very close in this axis of x t minus tau, but further away if from x of t. And so that would be close in state space, but it won't necessarily be, uh, won't necessarily be super close in the value of x of t. Um, so if y is merely correlated with x, um, it may not have that similar value for y. Okay, so let's let's further explore this point. Okay, um, right. Okay, so we've, we've made these uh, these points here. Um, right. Um, Yes. Uh, okay. So the fundamental method that we're going to use to quantify the degree to which y is driving x is actually a matter of convergence. It's not a single number, but it involves a given metric. And this metric is defined in terms of this thing called rho. Okay. Uh, and we're going to consider how the value of rho changes. How the value of rho changes as we ha consider closer points or further points from in, in, in state space as reconstructed from x. Okay? So we're going to be looking at here how rho changes when we consider different densities of sampling in state space. So as we are sampling more densely in state spaces, we consider a larger number of the points in state space, 
how would the val value of rho differ? Rho is going to be a measure of similarity between the value of state space uh, of, of y of t to for nearby points, what are their values? And we're going to look for certain patterns uh, associated with rho as we consider a larger so-called library of points in a sm or versus a smaller library of points. Okay. Um, so the idea is that we are going to consider points that are spread out more versus points that are very, very tight. And we're going to do that by considering subsets of this, this reconstructed shadow manifold. So we're going to consider, if you look at this board, I'll sort of illustrate it in an animated fashion. If we have an L that's quite large, we're going to be considering shadow manifold with more points in it. Okay? So L might be a hundred. You know. And in general, L is like you know, thousands. So here it's gonna be like a hundred points in here. Think of maybe point. Um maybe a hundred of them. Um so if L is like 100, we're going to be considering many points in the state space, okay? And in this reconstructed state space. And if we consider a given point, oh, now I've really fussed it up. Um, I'm going to invert the colors. Um, imagine here's, here's a, an index point, a, a point of consideration. We're going to consider for a given T associated with that point. Pick a point at time t. Consider its embedding. That's what this is. Consider its embedding. That locates it here. Right? Considering at time t, this gives me a vector. It's right there. And I'm going to consider other nearest points within this state space. Um, those will tend to be quite close because I've got lots of these points. So maybe I'll consider the closest seven points here, or eight points. In general, you use e plus one points, I think it is. Okay. So, so here, if it's e is three, then we use the closest four points in state space. Not in time, in state space. Closest four points do that. And we're going to ask for the exponential weighted average of those points, it's going to be a weighted average of the value of y. We're considering y of t, and we're comparing it against y of t for these nearest points in, in space, for the times associated with them. Uh, and we're going to weight it exponentially, so those that are twice as far away will will be really low weighted compared to those, you know, at half that distance. Um, we're going to be asking for, we're going to be comparing y of t with that exponential weighting from, it's going to be called y hat of t, um, from its neighbors, okay? And this is the, the exponentially weighted from neighbors. So x weighted from neighbors, okay? Um, from neighbors. And, and we're going to do this for many, many points. Maybe for all of them in that reconstruct manifold. And I ask, ask what's the average row? Or we'll take subsets of them of length L. So we'll take a subset of 100. We'll do this for every point in that 100. And then we'll do it again for another subset. And so for a given L, let's say L equals 100, maybe that's the one I've just drawn, I'm going to get a couple values of rho. 
Um, some of them will be low, some of them will be high. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be for that library size. This is 100 points. You might ask, why are there many points here? Because there's different subsets of L. Maybe the entire shadow manifold is 100,000 points, and I'm taking different subsets of 100. Okay? And for each subset of 100, I'm going to go through each point in it and find its nearest neighbors and, com and, and compare y of t with the reconstructed y of t from those neighbors, and I'm going to take their correlation over those 100. Okay? And each of those is going to give, give a value of rho as computed from those 100. And then I can do the same thing with L equals 200. And so that would involve that would involve filling in more points than this yet. Here we go, from that 100,000 from which this is drawn. Filling this in, and I would, by virtue of doing this, I'm creating a lot more closer points yet for each of these, and I'm asking, how does rho vary for that? So if I've got more points, they're going to be closer yet, and how does this uh, closeness um, in state space translate into closeness and value of y, if at all. Um, and maybe it translates woo, translates uh, to higher levels of rho. So it's indicating that as we get closer in state space, we tend to have closer values of y. And But meanwhile, if I, if I were to take this down to L equal 50, here we go. Um, that will tend to yield lower correlations between what we get for y for the index point versus its closer ones, because they tend to be further in state space. And maybe down here, L equals 25, we tend to have lower ones yet, because, because we don't have things that are too close in state space, um, and they tend to have very disparate values of y. And this would start to suggest that probably there's a causal connection uh, between them. Um, yes? So I know that rho expresses the strength and relationship, but when you were explaining, you said it's showing the similarities between y and y in the manifold. So similarities means like how close they are in the state space. So, so rho is assessing the similarity. It's a it's a correlation metric that we use to correlate two things. And it's actually not Im that important about which correlation metric you take. But you can use several. But it's used to assess correlation between y, of, y for different points and y hat of t, which is y re the, est the estimate of y reconstructed from the nearest points to this one in state space. Okay? If those two are tightly correlated, it's an indication that nearbyness in state space translates into nearbyness in the value of y. Okay? Um, because you're performing this estimated calculation, the estimated one, y hat of x of t you're performing that over nearby points. Nearby in what? Nearby in state space. So the points you've chosen to gather this estimate of y of t are the nearest ones to this point reconstructed at time t. Um, uh, those are the nearest points to that in the state space reconstructed from x. Okay. And 
and you're assessing the relationship between that, to what degree does, does closeness in the state space, the shadow manifold reconstruct from X, translate into closeness in Y? Hmm? So to what degree does Y, is Y part of the state of the system that's driving X? That's kind of what this is asking. To what degree, because if, if Y is driving X, we would expect that it's part of the state of the system that's affecting X. And therefore, being close in state with respect to X means close in Y. Hmm? And, and so that's why we look for this sign as to how much closeness in state as, as closeness in state space the shadow manifold reconstruction from X translates to closeness in Y. Does that make sense? Um, now what's subtle about this is we're doing this for different library sizes and that's because at larger library sizes we're looking at a denser number of points here. We're looking at points that are closer yet, closer yet, and we're seeing to what degree as we consider closer and closer points in state space as reconstructed from X, it means tighter and tighter correlation between those points and the actual value of Y. Mm -hmm. And we would expect as this uh, as we are considering closeness, more and more tight levels of closeness, it'll lead to more and more tight values, or l larger values of better or better ability to skillfully predict why. Does that make sense? Based on, on nearby points. Now, the key thing that's lurking in the background here, there's something that I'm not yet, I'm not yet seriously grappling with, okay? And that thing is statistical correlation that's not causal. Things where Okay, let, let, let me let me let me sort of you know uh, give you an example, right? Um, so there's a lot of things, if we consider natural systems, hairs and links, for example. There's a lot of aspects um, of the system that might co-vary with the two. So maybe, maybe hair popu I don't know if this is the case, but maybe hair populations tend to go down in the winter because of the severe temperatures. You know, um, that there's some some hairs that don't make it because of the, the you know the extreme cold and there's some that and then in the summer you know the the there's, there's a special word for hair babies I'm trying to remember what it is it's they're called hair oh gosh I, I should know what it is um, I learned it nine years ago in this room um, uh, but the hair babies um, maybe uh, are, you know, th they, they bloom. But there's lots of other things in that system which also go seasonally. Apparently they're called kittens. Kittens? Yeah, I was thinking kits, but that didn't sound right. Kittens? Yeah. Hair babies? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, that's not to say hairy babies. Like... Like, oh, the I'm sorry. I <laughs> like the Shao Ma Wa. That was before leverance. YouTube, not remember, I think. Leverance. A hair is a baby is a leveret. A rabbit baby is a kitten. Is a kitten? So that leveret is, leveret. is I think, the word you're Okay, looking. how do you spell it? L E V E R E T. Okay. Leveret. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So. The thing that we have to grapple with here is there are correlations that are not causal. This is an absolutely central thing. And in fact, 
there are causal effects that do not lead to correlation. So for example, case in point, these variables are all causally related. And I think x, I, I can't remember the exact thing, but I think x depends on y and z directly, and y depends on z, maybe not x, or something like that. But in any case, there, there's tight there's right tight uh, causal connections between them, but there are they're not in fact always correlated. Um, in fact, this is true for a lot of systems that are coupled. That correlation does not imply causation, and causation does not imply correlation. You can have things, amongst other things, that are causally associated in an anti-correlated way, in a way that is positively correlated or in a way that has no long-term correlation but they're causally driving one another. How do we deal with these things is, is the question and that's what a lot of the reasoning for, um, uh, for, for causal cross-mapping has to deal with. Okay, so let's consider Y driving X, okay? Um, if Y drives X, it's like we've seen there, it leads to converge, so-called convergence with rising, uh, to, to rising values of rho, um, because basically, as you add points in, closeness in the reconstructed state space, uh, M sub X in the shadow manifold, um, the results from, from reconstructed from X, um, you tend to have Y closer and closer to this. We fill in points around P and the estimates of Y generated from these get closer and closer to the true value of, of, of Y. So as we kind of, uh, I don't know that I have this uh, picture, but as we sort of get tighter and tighter around this ball, red ball, if, if Y is driving X, Y is part of the state driving X, closeness in state space means closeness in value to Y. It's, it's its part of its state is y, and therefore it will tend to be close values of, of y. Um, and, um, and here the correlation row will rise as we consider more, more points in the state space, and the library of points goes up. And in the absence of noise, and this is an important comment, a row approaches 1 as l goes to infinity. It'll approach 1. You get something like that. Okay. Um, and this is what you see. So as library size rises, each of these, you, you see these fringes and so on, these dots, um, these result from different realizations, different subsets of, in this case, about 500 points. So if I grab 500 random points, sometimes it will lead to a low row, sometimes it will lead to a very high row. Most of the rows tend to fall in here. This is a sign of very likely causality, and it rises to about point, in this case, it's like point eight five eight six or something like that, okay? This is noiseless system cross-correlation uh, from, from causality. There's another causal case without, without noise. It goes to basically one after a certain number of points. You need like 500 points here, um, a library of 500 points, but it, it just zips in. Notice the swing up, and this is due to statistical reasons that I've derived before, but basically you're dealing with small numbers down here, and and it's not reliable, okay? Um, uh, but as you get a larger number of points in your library, your ability to determine row reliably rises and you'll get a, a higher and higher correlation. Okay. Now imagine there's no causal dependence. Imagine there's no probabilistic dependence of, of X on Y. X and Y are independent statistically and they're independent causally. This first one we had a causal connection. Here we have no connection. Okay. There's no causal connection, and x and y are independent. Closeness in the value of m sub x will not necessarily tell you anything about the value of y. Doesn't tell you anything. I mean, closeness in the state space 
determining x, and if the value of x doesn't vary with the value of y at all, and if and if y is not driving it, it's not part of the state driving x, um, y for nearby points will be, you know, y will be sampled from different times where the state space is very similar, but the values of y can be profoundly different. The state space of x may be similar nearby, but value of y can be profoundly different from very different times. Um, so here, filling in nearby points and in the shadow manifold will typically not lead to improvements in estimating y of t. Um, uh, because these other points are from very different points of no causal connection with y. Um, you, may, you may be closer in the shadow manifold, but that doesn't tell you anything about the value of y. There's no particular rhyme or reason for the values of y involved. Closeness means nothing for the value of y. So it's, it's not going to really change. It's going to be something like that. As we consider a regular library, the value of rho is, is not going to be, is not, it, the, okay, early on, it turns out there's some statistical variability. You're getting random subsets, tiny subsets of, of, of points. You get rows all over the map. But as you come out, I mean, basically it's centered at zero. There's no real correlation. No real bearing on closeness in state space versus closeness in y. Big difference from this. Big difference. This is causal driving because y is part of the state driving x. Here, y is not part of the state driving x, and it's, it's uncorrelated. Um, there's no, there, there was no, in this past one, there was no probabilistic dependence, no statistical dependence. Okay, how about case three? There's no causal connection, but there's a probabilistic dependence between them. This one is rather more subtle. So maybe we have some other factor, z, that influences x, but influences y too. y isn't influencing x, but maybe this common thing is, right? Maybe this common thing is weather or something, you know, temperature. And, you know, you've got hairs and you've got frogs and the frogs are affected by the weather like hares are as well. Um, and, and, you know, there's some correlation b seen between frogs and hares um, that's, uh, that's, you know, fictitious. One might say it's finer than a frog's hair. That's okay. Sorry? Is this the same as we learned in epidemiology class, like the confounding factors? It is, it, 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 this, this is often associated with confounding, yes. This is true. But, but what we're examining here are causal methods that probably weren't talked about in that epidemiology class. But you, absolutely, that often in epidemiology, you're interested in probing associations between two variables um, because you, you think there could be a causal linkage. And if it's a very strong statistical linkage, it raises the tantalizing possibility. Maybe there's a causal link there. But you want to control for confounders, right? That maybe there's another confounder that's leading to these both be high rather than it being driven by this. And, and so you're looking for it, absolutely. Okay, so let's consider a case of probabilistic dependence. A case where you have statistical dependence in x and y. So y is not driving x, but z is driving y maybe, and z is driving x, and y tends to be high when x is high, maybe, for example. y tends to be low when x is low, for example. 
Okay, consider now very low library size. So very low size here, okay? Down, down here or down here. Um, this is library size, L, okay? Here are spaces sparse, points around or distance. Nearby points to an index point P, if we consider a point P, um, we consider the points nearby it, will we'll tend to be associated with very different values of X and therefore different values of Y too. Um, uh, uh, and the nearby points, values of Y are sort of sampled from, from values of, 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 of Y. Um, now, importantly, and this is um, right. Um, importantly, the nearby values of in state space m sub x will not necessarily have the same value of x of t. They may be have similar, very similar values of x of t minus tau and x of t minus 2 tau. That's why they're super close, but not of values of x of t. So it won't always mean that y is y of t is going to be uh, similar to the values of y for those, those others. Um, moreover, for very low L, um, uh, we're, we're going to be estimating rho from from very small windows, uh, very very small positions, and many many particular windows. But there's a large variation because the windows are very small. Sometimes we may get a lot of variation, sometimes lower. So there's a lot of variation here. Okay. Um, uh, and we, we talked about this before. Let's talk about L, okay, high L. So here are spaces dense in, if we consider the reconstructed shadow manifold, it's very dense. Nearby points will tend to be associated with values of X very close, fairly close to X of T, and therefore associated with values of Y that are similar to sort of um, to this correlation uh, you know based on the correlation that are, that have some similarity so if you consider P of Y given X of T um, uh, we're gonna have some distribution and they're gonna be associated with like draws from that distribution um, and uh, okay this is this is quite interesting <laughs> formatting um, so uh, here, uh, we're going to have lower statistical variability um, within a given window, because the window is large. Um, and we'll tend to get a correlation here um, that will approach the correlation between x of t and y of t, is, is how I understand it. I've got to actually formally derive that. But, um, but here, we, we simulate. We, we rather sample many many windows L, um, and we're going to see uh, some variability in, in in rho from these different um, different windows. Okay, so we're going to have basically these different windows, and um, the windows are of length L. L is quite large, uh, and we're going to have some statistical relationships um, uh, associated with y, that means y for a given value of x will be somewhat, will be somewhat similar. But um, uh, essentially we're going to get a, a value of, uh, of rho that is going to reflect this correlation between x and y. It's going to reflect a correlation between x and y, and it's going to detect. It's going to con converge to that correlation between the two. It's going to sort of converge to something given by that correlation, as we consider values of L. And so early on, there's a lot of statistical variability for low L, 
as we consider larger L, we're going to get it converging onto something that indicates the statistical dependence. So here we have a statistical dependence. Y is dependent on, on X, or here it's delta Z and, and W. There's some statistical relationship. So you'll notice that this converges to something that's non-zero. Rho is, point, is just below 0.2 here. It's like 0.1. Six or something. Contrast that to this. This converged to zero. No statistical dependence. Here it's converging to some level of to some level of rho. As we're considering larger and larger L's with with low L, low L, we get lots of statistical variability, and so we get lots of variability here. By contrast with high L, it's going to converge to this correlation. It's going to converge to something that indicates the correlation. Not zero, but a correlation. But I would note that that looks quite different than this. This is the sign of causal dependence. This is rising sort of monotonically. As we fill in, it's getting closer and closer to a large value, even more so here. It's getting closer and closer. Here, it's not getting closer and closer in that sort of upswing way. It's starting from great variability, and it's coming down. OK. Um, OK, so we'll go through this related argument again. We'll go through this, this argument with this related point. We'll go through the point again from a, a similar argument. Suppose that X and Y are statistically dependent, but Y does not causally influence X. Now consider a point P and neighboring points. Um, if we consider the state of the system driving X, which does not include Y, because Y does not, does not causally influence X, Similar values of x of t. Um, uh, these points will tend to have similar values of, of x of t. Um, and x of t minus t tau, x of t minus 2 tau. Um, so they tend to be associated with somewhat correlated values of y. Um, but filling in neighboring points in the state space around this, um, uh, they'll be associated with 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 tighter values of y, and it will tend to to converge towards this correlation. It doesn't lead to to sort of a general swing upwards. It's larger and larger as you add points in. It doesn't go to to this sort of approach one or approach a very high value. Instead, it tends to converge to something that reflects the correlation. Okay. Um, uh, reflects it, right. Um, yeah. Um, another view of this that you'll sometimes see here in the explanations of the inventor of this method, uh, George C. Gihara, is you can also uh, view CCM as assessing the tightness of mapping between shadow manifolds. Um, so if you have one shadow manifold sort of uh, reconstructed from X, and a sh uh, this one, and another shadow manifold reconstruct for Y, how tight is this sort of mapping between them? Um, he likes to, to talk about that um, as another, uh, another way to look at it. Okay. Um, okay. So what's the basic way that we use this method? Well, look, to assess a causal connection between Y and X, just as on the board there, what we do is we perform what's called X cross map Y. So basically, we reconstruct a shadow manifold from X. We reconstruct sort of this, this shadow manifold from X for a library of length L. And we consider it for different Ls. And we consider how rho rises. Okay? And in the absence of noise, Y driving X will mean the coefficient rho approaches 1 with large enough Y. Um, 
And the stronger the causal connection, the, the faster the convergence. So consider, for example, this versus this. This has very strong, I'm uh, sorry, very weak causal connection compared to this, is the idea. That this is a, a faster um, convergence because of faster causal connection. And I believe that's the case there. Um, so the key value to look here, the key factor is how does rho change as L rises, the library size, if we're considering closer and closer points. Okay. Um, now, you really need to, and this is lost in a lot of uses and commentators on CCM, you really want to do it with many realizations. Because each realization, selecting subsets of L, leads to different values of rho. And you get these outliers. This is another example of a causal connection here. Okay. Um, and how do you exam how do you and in practice, how do you distinguish true cross mapping, causal causal linkage from merely statistical linkage? Um, well look, uh, you're gonna look for some things. So so you're going to be Tr looking at how does it converge as you increase L. In particular, the sign of converging from below actually builds confidence that it's, it's true cross-mapping convergence. Um, this would suggest that it's not true cross-mapping convergence. You see this kind of crest. Um, uh, and uh, and you, you need to look at more than the mean. You need to look at sort of this, this envelope, okay? Um, particularly, uh, you need to look at the trend for less, L is less than 250 or so. That's about here. You, need, you really need to look, is it, is it swinging up, okay? Um, and I like to look at it quite high density there. Um, uh, and, uh, <coughs> You know, I, I think that uh, statistical convergence um, uh, can lead to um, the means of the rows rising. And this is one of the reasons you need to look at, a, at an ensemble, and a, a sort of a whole envelope here, not just the mean, not just the average. Okay, here, so here's a bunch of examples. And this one is affected by a bug in the R package we used. So these are non-causal. These are strong causal. These are causal here. And these are weakly or indirectly causal. Okay? All Y does Y influence X. Um, uh, and this is from a pred prey model. Okay? Um, so here you could see very strong evidence of causal linkage. Y is driving X. Here, Y is driving X, but it's driving it weakly or indirectly, like through Z. Y drives X and X, uh, sorry, Y drives Z and Z drives X, for example. Here, basically, non-causal connection. Okay. Um, now, this is with high noise. This is no noise right now, no noise. This is high noise, and you'll start to see how noise presents a problem. By noise, I mean the system being knocked around stochastically. It's not just the causal drivers. There's, st there's, there's other m sort of uh, stochastics hitting it. Take a look at this. Take a look at the causal linkage. Still quite, quite strong causal signal. No big problems there. Take a look at the non-causal. No real ambiguities there. Take a look at the weekly causal. I would count this as non-causal. It's, I just don't see a strong indication of causality there. And even this, I'd be worried about. I'd say probably, I don't trust this as being causal. These ones, sure. Causality, uh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, causality, 
indirect causality. You notice, no noise, here it's a slower convergence. Slower. Okay, this is statistical convergence, okay? Um, uh, and uh, the convergence from above is again an indication this is unlikely to be causal. Um, don't look at just the mean, look at the envelope. Um, and, uh, you know, there is some sweep up from the bottom, but there's a lot of sweep from the top. This crest, this deceitful crest, um, suggests that it's not, in fact, causal. And a lot of commentators here use means. These are the means involved. You can see they're kind of misleading because they sweep up, okay? Um, and, uh, and this is with statistical convergence. You can still get a sweep up at the beginning. So this is CCM. Ladies and gentlemen, we've talked about within this lecture, oops, uh, hey, 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 okay, where is this? Ooh. Um, I wanted to get to that final reminder slide here. Ooh. Okay, here we go. Embedding. We began the day, began the lecture, and I will again end the lecture with a reminder on embedding. Embedding gives us many things. It gives us insight into state space where we lack recourse to all variables. It lets us recognize the hidden order and regularities and orderliness behind time series that are otherwise messy or look hard to anticipate, predict, etc. It can allow us to visually or formally assess dimensionality. It can allow us to predict in state space not merely point to point in some arbitrary output of the system. And finally, and most intriguingly, I think, it can allow us to assess causal influences from one time series to another. Is there uh, an influence from Y to X? Is there a causal influence from X to Y? Is it both ways or neither using time series data? And why is this? It is because, ladies and gentlemen, within these systems of which we speak, these coupled nonlinear systems, the values of one variable speak to us in a holographic way almost about what's going on throughout the parts of the system that affect that variable. Just as hairs speak volumes to us the evolution of the hair population speaks volume to us about what the, how many links are around, or vice versa. Knowing about the values successively for one, one variable can tell us, whisper to us, sometimes shout to us about the values of the, the state uh, that's driving, the underlying state space that's driving to us. When we look at a time series, that's drawn from a system. We have to remember that we are not dealing, in a deep sense, we're not dealing with measurements only about one point in the system. We're dealing with measurements that relate to the whole system that lies behind it, driving that. And that fundamental insight opens the doors for us to have a much richer form of data science, one that recognizes the fact that different measure ends so all speak to us about a common system. They're far from being solitudes. They're joined at the hip. They're different faces on the underlying system, and we can use them to understand that system. Information in one gives us information about the other, and we can assess the, the, the causal linkages between them in a way that's so much richer than merely understanding associations. And we're going to build on these points in coming lectures uh, as we go into more material, including from this very room, nay, from this very podium tomorrow. <laughs>
10.30. Thank you very much.